Hey class, as uh, explained in the uh, video lecture, um, I was running short on time and decided to make sure we covered the material and said I would do some examples then in a supplemental. And so I listed three, but let me actually then throw another two in there. But let me start with the three I listed. The first one I listed was number 24. Um, this was in our discussion about the Hall effect. It says an EMF is produced based up on these uh, three factors and uh, the strength of the field, the length of the uh, separation, and the velocity. So <clears throat> that being said, we I'll, I'll just direct you back to the uh, lecture video for the uh, equation and the evaluation of the Hall effect. Let's read the problem. It says, what is the speed of a supersonic aircraft with a 17 meter wingspan if it experiences a 1.6 volt Hall effect? So as the airplane flies through, uh, maybe I'll, it says it's supersonic, so it's gonna have to have some curved wings, but maybe, well, uh, do that uh, 17 meters across. It might be easier to kind of visualize the wing as one straight bar. And so here's the fuselage. Uh, but here is this 17 meters. And, and what happens is if you are flying over the uh, North Pole, the magnetic field, and maybe I'll do the magnetic field in green, and so let's say we're looking down, uh, this would be a magnetic field pointing in, so I'll do this. And so if the airplane is moving in a direction to the right here, we would have this V and the B, and so if we took our right hand, let's see, and put our fingers, thumb in the direction of V and fingers in the direction of B, you'll see that the positives would get pushed this way. Now, there's a bunch of negatives in a metal plane, so what happens is a bunch of negatives build up here, and they leave from there. And so there's a voltage across there. Now, it's not like the current keeps traveling. In fact, I think I'll answer B because B says, explain why you'll get very little current that flows because what ends up happening and maybe switching to another color like blue is as a bunch of negatives get over to here, there's an electric field that gets unestablished which is pushing the electrons back the other way. Or put another way, once you get a couple of electrons down here, the next one doesn't want to go there. So eventually there's a balance point reached and you don't get like a continuous flow of current like you would if it was a 1.6 volt battery. So this isn't going to really produce any useful current, but it is going to pr produce a voltage and you can even measure that voltage and hence maybe say something like, what is the speed of the airplane? Uh, there's other ways of getting the speed of the airplane. So that's probably not the, the most uh, convenient one here. But, but that is what our question is. It says, what is the speed of a supersonic aircraft? All right, so let me put in the numbers. So the EMF that is produced is the 1.6 volts. The magnetic field at this point is 8 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. The length of the wingspan is the 17 meters, and the V is the unknown. So numbers would be 1.6 divided by 8 times 10 to the minus 5, and also divided by 17. So there's the numbers. The units would be a voltage over a Tesla over a meter. Uh, let me start with the, the numbers. Uh, that's probably the easiest part, 1.6. Uh, divided by 8 times 10 to the negative 5, uh, divided by 17. And so this is 1,000, uh, I'll call it 180. And now I suppose I should check to see if this is in meters per second or what does this come out to be. And this will give me a chance to point out a, a couple of, of features. Uh, maybe I'll start with the Tesla. Remember, the Tesla is 
a newton per coulomb for each meter per second. That's the easiest way to remember it. As we said, it's a measurement of how much force you would get per charge and then per one unit of speed. So we've got the times of the meter here. And let me write the volt here as a joule per coulomb. And those are a lot of complex units here. So let's simplify this a little bit. Let me just put joule over coulomb here. Let me put Newton times meter here. Uh, this being a compound fraction, I can flip it and get coulombs meters per second. Okay, so it looks like the coulombs would cancel off. And it looks like we're also going to get, and you can maybe see it here, a Newton times a meter is the same as a joule. And we're going to be left with units of meters per second, as we, as we should. So the unit analysis works well here. And so that's kind of the Hall effect in my first example. Now, the other one I said in the lecture video that I would do was number 32. And I believe that had something to do with the force on a wire or a torque or, or, or something like that. Let's see, 32. Ah, yes. Oh, 32. Oh, it has a nice little uh, picture. Yeah, that's right. Okay, bear with me here for a second because I think it would be more instructive if I copy that and paste it. And then I could have a picture come out of the printer and I can put something here in the, the screen that I think you'll appreciate more. All right, so let me hit uh, print and, and get that coming out. Uh, but I'll read the problem why the printer is doing its thing here. It says, find the direction of the current that experiences a magnetic force shown in each of the cases uh, in figure 54. That's what I just printed here. So here it is coming out of the the printer, okay. And so, assuming that the current runs perpendicular to B. Now, this, if you remember, we had two equations. Force is QVB sine theta. And I argued very quickly that a bunch of charges moving at a speed is the same as a current over a given length. So these two equations, I like to say, are uh, one in the, the same, okay? And uh, I'm wondering if your author used a lowercase l or an uppercase l. And uh, I don't want to turn the page in my PDF here. So, I, But I'm thinking it was a lowercase l. But in either case, l is the the length of the wire. And we're not even asked to do a calculation in, in this one. We're asked to find its direction. Although maybe I should look at the top of the page. It might have more to it. No? Okay. So here, again, it says, what is the direction? And so here's where that right hand comes into play. And so our thumb, if we're doing this equation, would be the direction of the velocity. And so the replacement of that is the direction of the current. And then our fingers are the direction of the magnetic field. And our palm is the direction of the force. Now for this one, since we could also have a negative charge, it doesn't happen for this equation, we could have the force on the backside of the hand for a negative charge. But positives would be this way, and that's the definition of a current. The direction a positive would move. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do this, and I'm going to apply that to this equation. All right, so let's see. Uh, we're asked what is the direction of the current. So it's the thumb where you want to know what direction it would point if, and so we need to put our fingers in the direction of the field. And so these little dots mean come out. So I'm going to point my right hand up at, at you, okay? Or you're probably looking on the screen, so I'll just say horizontally towards you. But anyways, it's, it's right here. It's pointing at you, okay? Um, then the force 
needs to be up. So I guess I need to kind of rotate my hand. Oh, I'm going to have to move to get this on the screen like that. Okay, so my palm is pointing up, and my fingers are pointing towards you, and my thumb then of my right hand is towards the left. So this must be the direction of the current for those three dimensions to work out. Okay, but let's try the same thing in, in B. And so in B, you can see that the force is still up. So I'm going to hold my hand again so my palm is, is, is up. But then it says the magnetic field, which is your fingers, are going to the right. So I guess I'll have to turn my right hand this way. Okay. So let's see. Got my force up. Got my fingers to the right. Good. And so my thumb is towards you. And so maybe I'll put a circle with a dot to label the direction of the, the current. Okay, and then this last one, let's see, I'll take my right hand and I'll put my palm towards the left here. That's the direction of the force. And my fingers are supposed to be the direction of the field. And that looks like it would be holding my hand this way because the field goes down. Okay. Okay. And then so my thumb is pointing up here. Okay, so the current would be up. All right, so that's the, the idea behind this, uh, this one that has uh, directions in it. And so now I can see why I picked that one. But it didn't have any numbers in it. A little disappointed in that. Maybe I'll find one with numbers here real quick. Maybe I'll, I'll scan. Let's see. Uh, hmm. Well, maybe I'll leave it at that and just say this will be a good supplement. And... I'm sure you guys will be asking questions, so I'll make a video with specific ones. All right, so there's the 32, the one I said I would, I would do. Let's do the third one I said I would do, and that is number 43 here. And uh, 43 says this. It says, find the current through a loop needed to create a maximum torque of 9 newton meters. The loop has 50 square turns that are 15 centimeters on one side and is in a uniform 0.8 Tesla magnetic field. Well, again, going back to the video lecture here, this was a formula worked out. And uh, like I said, I didn't actually work it out, although I did take the time to show you the result and kind of explain why there would be a, a torque. Uh, maybe I'll take a moment to do that yet again. But if I just had a square loop of current, so let's say the current goes up and the current comes down, and then there was a magnetic field pointing to the right. On this little piece right here, the current would go up. So I'll put my thumb of my right hand up. And I'll put my fingers of my right hand to the right, the direction of the field. And my palm then would be pointing in. So I'll put a little X and say... This part of the wire would have a force in. And see, this part of the wire, now that the current has gone up, it's going to arc around and come down. And so I will put my thumb in the direction of the down. And again, my fingers need to go in the direction of the field. And so my palm is towards you. So that would make a force... On that wire, this way. See, and that's a twist. That's a torque. That This one gets pushed in, and this one gets pulled out, and it makes it rotate around in a circle. 
And of course, if this is the axis it's rotating, this would be the lever arm, if we go back to physics 110 or our torque. And so this is the force from this wire, so it's not a surprise that one dimension is the height of this square wire and another is the torque, and the torque from both sides. So it's not a surprise that the factor of the area shows up. It's also not a surprise that it's how many turns, because whatever is true for one loop around, if you wrap the wire around many times, you get a bunch of them. And of course, not a surprise that it has to do with the current and the magnetic field. So maybe that was too much of a little review lecture. Let's just actually then plug in our numbers. So here is torque. And then, so, uh, 43, I'll read it again here. Find the current, okay? And so we've got this NIAB. And notice it says here the maximum torque is. So they're saying when it is at 90 degrees, that's when we get our maximum. We know a sine function does this kind of thing. It starts at zero, goes up to one, and it kind of just oscillates between a one and a negative one. So the biggest it ever gets is one. So when they say the maximum torque is nine newton meters, they're saying that is occurring at an angle of 90 degrees. So don't overlook that piece of the puzzle. They do say it has 50 square turns. So for N, I'm gonna put 50. And then here is the I, that's the whole point of this problem. It says find how much current is needed to make this much torque. So there's what we're trying to solve for, the I. And then the area says it's a square and it's 15 on a side. Now I will change the 15 centimeters, however, to meters. So that I'll have 0.15 times 0.15 and get that in square meters. And then they do say it's in a uniform magnetic field of 0.8 Tesla. And so let me do like a lot of these problems. Let me put the numbers together and the units together. The numbers would be a 9 here divided by a 50 uh, divided by a 0.15 and I'll just say squared and then divided by a 0.8. So there's the numbers. And I'll look at that in just a second. Looking at the units here, this would be a Newton times a meter up here, down here, or multiplying these would be meters squared when I bring it over. And then I got this Tesla. So that Tesla, remember again, is Newtons per Coulomb per meter per second. Okay. So running the numbers isn't real hard. It's 9 divided by 50, also divided by a 0.15 squared, also divided by a 0.8. And so, oh, it comes out to be an even 10. I didn't... 225 times 5? I. Okay. All right. Um, but other than the numbers were given kind of nice, it comes out to be an even 10... Uh, let's look at the uh, units. Uh, maybe I can even just simplify. Here's a Newton canceling with that. There's a meter canceling with one of those. There's another meter canceling with one of those. Uh, then I have a coulomb per second. That right there is an amp, and it would be the denominator of the denominator. So when you flip it around, you get an amp. And so sure enough, 10 amps is the the answer here for number 43. All right, so that's the ones I had promised in the video lecture uh, I would do, and hopefully those were helpful. But we talked about some other things rushing there at the end and didn't get a real chance to do any of them. And uh, let me just try a number 50 and a number 68. I think they might be kind of useful here. So number 50 says what? It says a hot and a neutral wires supplying DC power to a light rail commuter train carries 800 amps and are separated by 75 centimeters. What is the magnitude and the direction of the force between 50? 
50 meters of wire. Discuss the practical consequence of this force, if any. Okay, so what they're, they're saying here, we've got a commuter train, a commuter rail, is often, and maybe even heard the phrase, don't touch the third rail, because a train runs on two tracks, but there's a third rail down the middle that is positively charged, and the current then flows from there through this electric motor and then goes to one or both of the rails, but then this is the return line, the, the, the negative or the ground line. And so somebody falls on the track or gets near the track, it's like, don't touch that third rail. That third rail is highly voltage. Uh, and it's, you know, not designed to support the weight weight of a train. It doesn't need to. It's just designed to carry the electricity down the rail and then through the motor. And that way you can run a, a subway system or a rail system on an electric motor without having to have the, a big power supply on the train itself. You just need the big motor on the, on the train and the electricity goes down the third rail. All right, so doing a little bit of the, the engineering now, uh, you could then conclude something like this. Let me not draw this bottom rail, but then I would have the middle rail, the third rail, and I'll put a little I here for the current. So it's coming from the power source. It goes down the third rail, goes through the motor and does its little pushing stuff then returns down the wheels and returns back. So we'll call that the negative. So you might say this is a giant power supply connected here, and it's sending current to this giant motor, which runs the whole rail system. But the short answer here is we've got two parallel wires, and that's why they say the hot, so this is called the hot, and the neutral, this is the ground or the neutral, supplies DC to a light rail center, and it's saying that this current is 800 amps. Now, since this is a series circuit, we can also conclude that the returning current is also 800 amps. So that's our conservation of charge, and that's, again, why we did all of our circuitry the last two chapters, so we could understand a little bit better about magnetism and solve some more complex problems. And so that was Kirchhoff's conservation of uh, charge argument here. Okay, so we've got the 800 amps coming in and then 800 amps going away. And so here's the, you know, the train is over here. But someplace while, the, you know, the train's not, there's going to be an interaction here. And that's what it says here. It says, what is the magnitude and the direction of the force between them? Now, let me start with putting two pieces together. Uh, the one piece I want to put together is that one of the first equations I gave you in section 9 says, what is the magnetic field from a long straight wire. So this is the equation, and to visualize it, we said use right-hand rule number two. In other words, if this is the equation for the magnetic field from these 800 uh, amps, imagine grabbing that wire with your thumb in the direction of the current, and the magnetic field then would be your fingers. Now, this is going to be a three-dimensional, so I'm going to have a little bit of a challenge drawing this, but I will try my best to draw it. And I will say, okay, so the magnetic field would do like that. It would loop around behind, come over the top like that. And what's real important here is another equation that we did an example a moment ago, saying the force on a current, on this lower one, depends how long it is and the strength of the field it's in and the angle between them. 
Ah, and so it's these two pieces that I thought this would make a good example. It's using one that I kind of rushed at the end, didn't really derive it. We can't derive it. I told you it takes calculus three and some vector calculus. Uh, it was developed by Amper or B.F. Savart, and uh, both are they're slightly different techniques, but they come up with the same answer. What I'm saying here is knowing then that this top wire is going to produce a magnetic field, you're really saying the bottom wire is a current that is in a magnetic field from the top wire. So maybe I'll just put the current in the bottom wire, so plus, comes from a field created from the top wire. I'll put a minus there since this is the, the minus piece. And, and so this, we talked a little bit about already, but this right here is the equation for that, that field. And so I'm going to put those two together. And that's really what this is all about. Now, I'll do the numbers in a second, but I want to focus on the direction. Because coming to the second part of this is what we need to do is do right-hand rule number one. Did you catch that? See, right-hand rule number two is telling me the direction of the magnetic field. And then once I know the direction of the field, together with the direction of the current, I need to use right-hand rule number one in order to figure out the direction of the force. So this is a good and a tough problem because we've got to put two things together here. The first one makes the field and the second one here, the bottom one, is actually a current in that field. And that's what I want to get at. So, again, I'll do numbers here in a second. But, well, maybe I should leave this page here. Uh, but I should focus then on direction. All right. So, coming here to figure out the direction of the force on this bottom wire, it needs to know the direction of the current and the direction of the field. So let's go back up to what I was doing earlier. I said this would be the equation for the field, but to get the direction, I would use right-hand rule number two. So I'm imagining myself grabbing this top wire, my thumb in the direction of the current, and notice then that in the position of this lower wire, the field... would arc around and right here be coming out of my page. That's the important thing to note. What direction is the field at wire two, or bottom wire, but it's created from number one, or the top wire. So all these green lines are the field that is created from the top wire, and this is the direction of the field at the bottom wire. That's what this right hand rule by grabbing the wire or pretending to grab the wire, thumb in the direction of the current and looking at my fingers. So one more time, this field is coming out of the screen. It's coming at you, okay? So now I'll go and use this equation and right hand rule number one, because right hand rule number one says, put your thumb in the direction of the current, okay? So there's the direction of the current. Number two, put your fingers in the direction of the field. Okay, field up. <laughs> Can't quite get my wrist to go that far. Okay, so there we go. And then your palm would be the direction <laughs> of the force. And so I'll draw the force in black, but it is clearly down. So these wires are actually repelling each other. Now, maybe we should go through and look at the force on the top wire, but I will say that I hope, because of Newton's third law, that if this is the force from the top wire on the bottom wire, then the force on the top wire from the bottom wire is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And so this is saying that these wires are being pushed apart. Uh, we'll see how big the force is. Normally, I'd say the force isn't really that strong, but again, normally we're not dealing with these enormous amount of current, is 800 amps. 
So it'll be interesting to see how much force that is. Of course, this is part of a rail system, so they're, you know, staked into the ground. It's not like they're going to push up. It's not going to be enough to bend the metal. It's, it is a repulsive force. And so if they were on their own, the wires would, you know, snap apart because of the magnetic force between them. Now, like I said, we might want to go through this one instead of just saying it's equal and opposite, just because it gives another experience. So let me do this. Let me say, what is the direction of the magnetic field from the bottom wire at the top? So I'm going to do right-hand rule number two. I'm going to pretend to grab the wire with my thumb in the direction of the current. So imagine me grabbing the bottom wire. So here's the, the bottom wire. Grabbing it with my right hand, with my thumb in the direction of the current. And notice as my fingers arc around, in the presence of the top wire, the field is coming out. So then if I apply this equation to the top wire, and going to the first right-hand rule, I will put my thumb in the direction of the current, and my fingers need to go in the direction of the field, which is up, like that. And then, so notice my palm, or I shouldn't say up, I should say out towards you, and then so my palm is up. And so that's what we got when we did the equal and opposite. So applying both right-hand rule number two to get the direction of the field, and right-hand rule number one, I can put those together to figure out the direction, okay? Now, the amount of force is probably the easier of the calculation, although I do need to put these two together. And so I'll go to another piece of paper here and say, so the force would be, and I suppose it doesn't matter which, one we call the current plus or minus, since in this case they're both 800. But there could be a problem where they both don't have the same current in them. So if I'm trying to find the current on this lower wire, I'm taking the force on this lower wire, I would take the current in that lower wire. So that's why I call it plus. I'd multiply by the length of that wire. And then the magnetic field, and here's what I'm saying, the magnetic field is coming from the top wire, so I'm going to put a mu naught times I from the top wire, which I'm labeling as a negative, and then 2 pi R, and R is the distance from that wire, so it's the separation of the, of the two wires. And then the last piece of this is the sine of 90 degrees. So remember the theta here is the angle between the current in the magnetic field. And so the current is going to the right and the magnetic field is coming out of the screen. So that's 90 degrees. I've got a, coming out of the screen would look like that and going to the right would look like this. And so there'd be a 90 degree angle there. And so 90 degrees. Okay, and so that's why I put 90 degrees. And sine of 90 degrees is just 1. All right, so now let me put in the numbers. And so this is 800 amps for the current of the bottom one. Uh, I need to come back to the problem, how long it says. Um, what is the magnitude and the direction of the force between 50 meters of these wires? So the length of the wire is 50 meters. Mu naught is that permittivity of free space we, we talked about. That was the 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. And for the units, again, coming back here, you can, you can kind of see that the units here would be a Tesla over an amp, to cancel that off, multiplied by a meter. So there's the mu naught. Now, the other current, this is the current from the top wire, it too is 800 amps. And then we will divide that by 2 pi. And R, coming back to this equation, was saying this is the distance away from the wire. And in this case, we want to know what the strength of the field is at the bottom wire. So the distance is the, between the two wires. 
And going back to the problem and reading it, they say the wires uh, are separated by 75 centimeters, which I'm going to write as in meters. And, of course, we can do the numbers and we can do the units. Uh, why don't I do the numbers first? In fact, I'm going to take that 2 pi and cancel off a little bit of the 4 pi, leaving myself a factor of 2. So here I would have 800, and if it will be okay with you, I'll just hit a square. I won't have to type the other 800 over here. Uh, then times a 50. Then times a 2 times 10 to the negative 7. I already did that. 800. The 2 pi already canceled off. And then I'll divide by 0.75. So this would be 8.53. And again, since it is a force, hopefully this does come out to be Newtons. But let's take a moment to kind of look at the units here. Um, it looks like one of the amps would cancel with one of the amps here. And it looks like that meter would cancel with that meter. And so it looks like I've got an amp and a meter here. Uh, then remember a Tesla is a Newton per coulomb times a meter per second. And if you group that per second with the coulomb, that coulomb per second is an amp, so it would cancel off with that amp. And then, of course, the meters would cancel off, and you're left with just units of newtons. So, again, it does work and kind of reminds me of what I said back in Chapter 1. It seemed kind of simple way back in Physics 110 when we did Chapter 1 and the unit conversion. But I said, we're, gonna, we're going to hit a lot of units that you have never seen before and you've never worked with. And converting from one unit to another is not simple. Uh, or, excuse me. I want to make it simple so we learn some techniques to think about the units. And so if we've learned those techniques and gotten a good habit of it, these crazy new units like an amp and a Tesla and a, uh, a volt and things you and, and an ohm and you know things you haven't seen before um, just hopefully naturally fall into place. At least that's kind of what I'm hoping. Okay, and I also said there were, I would try another one. Hopefully my supplement's not too long, okay? But if you're still hanging with me and you want to see another good example, um, I think number 68 fits this category because 68 has both a loop of a circle and a straight wire. Now, we've talked a little bit about the straight wire, but we haven't really done the loop. And this has both of them. And so let me actually, when I'm talking here, copy that and print the little picture here so that I can kind of work this, this out here. Let me read the problem while my printer is printing here. But it says, figure 62 shows a long straight wire just touching a loop that carries a current I. So here's the, the picture. Okay. And here we've got, as it says, a long straight wire of current number two. So it shows a long straight wire uh, just touching number one. Now, looks like number one, they tell us the direction. And so from our viewpoint, it looks like it's counterclockwise. But they don't tell me the direction of number two. So keep that in mind. It says both lie in the same plane. A, what direction must be the current number two in the straight wire have to create a field at the center of the loop in the direction opposite to that created by the loop? All right, so it's a two-step process. The first one is we need to find the direction of the current from this loop. Now, do I have anything that I can make a loop with that's nearby? Oh, yeah, my little diagrams here. Okay, 
So it's not real fancy, but at least I can pick it up off the page and poke my finger through it. So let me just kind of take this twist tie. <laughs> twist it together here. Kind of make it in a little circle here. And here's where I'm going to illustrate right-hand rule number two again. So right-hand rule number two is going to give us what directions are the current. And in the problem we just did, we had straight wires. So I'll use the pen as a straight wire. And we said, grab it with your right hand so your thumb is in the direction of the current. Okay. Now, we don't have a straight wire, but we can imagine maybe a little section right here that's straight. So if I grab this with my right hand, or at least imagine grabbing it with my right hand. My hand's a little too big for it. But if the current right here is kind of going up, Notice with my thumb in the direction of the current, my fingers right at the center are curling up this way, or I should say out towards you and uh, out of the screen. And so I'd say this little section is making the field come out of the screen. But if you do that for every section, this one also makes it come out of the screen. This one here also makes it come out of the screen. This one here also makes it come out of the screen. And so this whole loop would have a bunch of little magnetic fields from each section of the loop, and they all would be coming out of the screen. So the total would be come out of the screen. So let me put in green here a circle with a dot, and I'll say B, and I'll put a number one, saying this is the direction of the magnetic field created from this loop. All right. So that's the one thing I need to know is what direction is that field? Because the question is trying to determine what direction does the current need to be in number two in order to be opposite of that. And I think if I keep reading on here, it says what would the ratio of the currents need to be to give zero field? So in other words, we're, we're trying to make two fields that are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So the total field at the center of this loop would be zero. If you had the loop by itself, it would be coming out of the screen. So let me say, here's my long wire. I'll just put my pin right here by that long wire. And if I grab my right hand and hold it this way, or this way, maybe I'll start this way because this is going to be incorrect. But you can see that my fingers are curling around, and on this part that is kind of above and to the left of this current would be coming out. And so if the current was going in the direction of my thumb, these would be in the same direction. And so what I want then is the direction something like this, where I would have the current going, I guess it's kind of down and to the left. But if you look at my fingers as I kind of curl them around, notice that above this wire, my fingers are pointing in. And so all in this area, the magnetic field would be going inward. And that's what I'm looking for. Now, granted, over here under the wire, the field would be coming out. Okay, but that's not part of this question yet. Although I I think they're going to touch on something quite interesting and in see. But I just want to know at the center what direction is the field. And so we have to have current going to the left. It's kind of a left down approach in order for this. To work. And that's the answer to A. What direction must the current in number two be in the straight wire in order to create a field at the center of the loop in a direction opposite to that created by the loop? Now, of course, then it goes on to say for B, what is the ratio of these two currents in order to give you zero field strength at the center? So these two fields are equal and opposite. So now I can do a, a calculation here. And uh, the field equation 
we got for the long straight wire was the mu naught i over 2 pi r. And so we just did an example like that one, number 50. But the other equation, again, not worked out because it involves some vector calculus, but given to you was what is the magnetic field from a single loop? And it's mu naught i over two times the radius. And we said this would be the magnetic field at the center of a loop. And now remember, r would be the distance away. But in this case, then, since they're just touching, the distance away from the long straight wire is also going to be the, the radius. So we want these two to be equal in magnitude. but opposites in direction. Now we already established the opposite of direction and I should distinguish between current one and current two. So the loop right here is current one and the long straight wire is current two. And so if we set those equal to each other, let's see what we, we get. Now, as I mentioned, I probably then should note that in this equation for the straight wire, r is the distance away, and since we're trying to find it right at the center, and this loop just touches, the distance away is the radius of the loop. And that's perfect, because look at the things that are the same on both sides. The mu naught cancels off, the 2 cancels off, and the r cancels off. And so if we move current one, or sorry, we leave current one alone and we move current two over to this side, we will be left with one over pi. And so the ratio is pi or one over pi, depending on which one you, you put, on, put on top here. But it looks like current two has got to be a little bigger than number one. Kind of makes sense too, because the field for the loop is all adding together every little section as we went around where the wire is just one time through. So you actually, this is the nice thing about making wires in loops. You uh, get the effect of increasing the, the strength of the, uh, of the field. All right, well, hope I didn't uh, talk too long or too much here, but uh, maybe this is a good place to stop and say, all right, hope all this helped. Talk to you later.